So our first speaker is Dr. Don Sin, who is um, a Canadian Research Chair in COPD. He was educated at the University of Alberta and at Harvard, and uh, then came here in uh, 2004 as a C uh, Canadian Research Chair in COPD, and uh, has uh, had been phenomenally successful uh, he's got a big research group, and he's very interested in biomarkers for COPD. He recently got a, a big grant from Genome Canada to uh, find biomarkers for COPD. Um, and uh, he's published uh, more than 260 papers, which I find remarkable because he's, he looks like he's 15 years old. <laughs> Not only that, he's uh, my boss. Years, yeah. <laughs> he, he's he's uh, the head of the respiratory division here uh, at St. Paul's Hospital, and so he's my boss. So I'm going to uh, sit down and let the boss take over. Well, as a boss, I would say you need to do more call. Uh, <laughs> somebody has to do work. Uh, so, you know, if it uh, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, you need a blood test. You know, so that, that's the essence of my talk. Um, so the only, th you know, hope uh, for my disclosure is that someday you'll be longer. Um, it's too short. So the question is, why do we need any sort of biomarker in COPD? After all, we have a very good marker or uh, a physiologic endpoint called uh, FEV1 or FEC or FEV1 to FEC ratio. Or if we want to get more sophisticated, TLC, RV, TLC, IC, and so on and so on. A lot of C's there. Well, let me just, you know, I think this is a point that I, I think everybody would agree with to a certain level, is that there are fundamental problems with FEV1. It's, it certainly has poor signal-to-noise ratio. At a population level, not, not, not a problem. If you have a big cohort, you'll get a signal. But at, at an individual level, there's tremendous individual heterogeneity and in outcomes uh, with the same degree of airflow limitation. Um, and I think somebody touched upon this earlier. It doesn't really reflect disease activity, and I'll show you some examples of how uh, FEV1 can be misleading in terms of disease activity. Now, you know, our COPD therapies are full of bronchodilators that impact on FEV1, but let's face it, it's not terribly responsive endpoint. And at the primary care level, not at the big ivory tower like St. Paul's Hospital, if you uh, consider this as an ivory tower, um, you know, access to lung function measurements can be challenging. It's improving, but it can be challenging. So let me show you the heterogeneity of uh, COPD for a relatively normal lung function. So this is uh, from uh, uh, Steve Lamb's cohort, and uh, Harvey has looked at these data in detail. So this is somebody with relatively normal looking lungs. Here's the same or a different individual with the same degree of FEV1. And you can see that there are holes in the lung and pretty big holes that I've circled here. And there are smaller holes that you cannot see, but it's present. And here's someone who has also normal lung function, albeit on the lower uh, limit of normal. But you can see about a third of this man's lungs are full of holes. So clearly, FEV1, although very useful for epidemiologic and research purposes, doesn't really capture the heterogeneity uh, of the disease process. Here's another way of expressing this. So these are data from the famous Eclipse study. So patients are stratified based on their FEV1, mild, moderate, and severe, or very severe airflow limitation. And number of exacerbations are plotted here. So uh, on an average basis, there is discrimination. So the lower the FEV1, the higher the risk of exacerbation. So everybody understands this. Everybody accepts this notion. What you don't know is the spread. Here's the distribution of people in each of the gold grades or gold stages and their number of exacerbation they've, they've experienced in the previous year. And you can see there's substantial overlap. There are people in mild category who had you know, three or four or 10 exacerbations. And there are those in stage four disease who had minimal zero to one exacerbation. So again, at the individual level, 
it doesn't really work very well. And the gold committee has gone away to a certain extent from um, therapies based strictly on FEV1 for this purpose. Let's take another uh, you know, patient-related outcome, breathlessness, as measured by MRC. And again, stratified based on FEV1. And at a population level, there's discrimination. So increased air flow limitation, greater level of dyspnea. But once again, there's tremendous spread in the risk of breathlessness within each category, again showing the relatively poor signal-to-noise ratio of FEV1 as an outcome. Here's another way of expressing this uh, in terms of looking at disease activity. If, if we measure disease activity as rate of decline of FEV1, and there are other parameters we can use to measure disease activity. This is one of many. And let's say you take a smoker with an FEV1 at 78% of predicted, and you follow them over 11 years, as the lung health study did, you will see this kind of curve. Some people, their lung function will be relatively steady over 11 years. Some people, for the same degree of smoking, will be like the red curve and just drop down. So again, you know, at using the baseline FEV1, one could not predict disease activity for that individual. Okay, well, how would this impact on drug uh, trials? And I've used data, I've lifted data from the uplift data to just show you, uh, uh, to make a point. So if uplift, for instance, uh, using the same criteria that uplift did, uh, evaluate a drug that had an efficacy of reducing the rate of decline of FEV1 by 10% compared to placebo, how many patients would uplift needed to show this at a P.05 level? And my rough calculation, back of the envelope calculation, says nearly 7,000 individuals would have, been, would have been needed to show a significant difference in rate of decline. Now let's say we say, well, let's use some clinical parameters you know, let's not have a heterogeneous population. Let's have all smokers, and let's have the gold one and two, just like the lung health study. We know, uh, as Peter pointed out, they decline faster than the gold three and four. Let's take those individuals, and let's take committed smokers, and their smokers at, you know, at entry. Then how many patients would you need to show this difference? And you would need 4,800. Still a very big number, but, you know, we can use some clinical parameters to reduce uh, the sample size, but still very big. Now, <clears throat> if we had a marker of disease activity, perhaps we can attenuate that number even further. And this was echoed by a recent editorial uh, by Jürgen Vespo and Steve Renard. I put this up because, you know, the disclosure uh, thing is getting ridiculous. It's longer than the editorial. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Needless to say, uh, you know, the title speaks for itself. There is an urgent need to develop a biomarker of disease activity in COPD. But it is challenging. So this is a, an article or a letter in Nature that looked at the number of publications for biomarkers in, you know, up until about 2010. There have been roughly 150,000. Um, and their point was that's yielded about 100 so-called clinically useful um, biomarkers, and many of those we already know, LDL and, you know, uh, and stuff like that, a a CD4 count and HIV, glucose, hemoglobin, a a you know, lot of yada, yada, yada. So what's the point here? The point here is it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's extremely challenging, and anybody who argues otherwise is fooling themselves. So it is like, rather like looking through a haystack and trying to find that needle. And so we need, I think, a careful, thoughtful approach to finding that needle. And we need tools to do so. And thankfully, this um, horse uh, has the tool, and he caught the needle. So the status quo probably is not working. And just by throwing some um, data at the wall, we probably w won't get the biomarker we want. So let's start with a definition of what a biomarker should be. And this is something that I've made up. And so uh, it's, you know, obviously subjective. 
So I would say a, a, a blood biomarker, at least in COPD, should be something that's simple, uh, inexpensive, should be reliable, and most importantly, enables the clinician, enables you and me to better manage our patients with COPD. Regardless of the p-value, it has to have some value for me to order it so that I can better manage my patients with COPD with the ultimate goal of, of improving their health status or some health outcome. So how do we get there? Well, obviously, I don't have the answer. Uh, but let me, let me share with you some of my uh, travails. So how can we tackle the needle in a haystack problem? It's trying to find the gold in this mist of a lot of dirt. So I think we have to understand a little bit about the pathophysiology, or at least the pathophysiology of the biomarker in question. We have to have some knowledge. We have to have very robust and very strong statistical and analytic platforms to uh, interrogate the data. And, and the second point I think is important is that it's highly unlikely that we're going to find a biomarker that is, you know, that associate with all the relevant outcomes in COPD. I think we have to decide what outcomes we want to interrogate. Is it death? Clearly an important endpoint in COPD, but a dirty one. Because COPD patients can die from violence. They can die from cardiovascular disease. They can be hit, hit by a truck. So death is a kind of a very difficult endpoint to, um, to associate biomarkers with, but nevertheless, an important one. Exacerbation or lung attacks, and it's a very important one, and uh, I will discuss this, uh, not today, but at a, at a different uh, uh, forum. Rate of decline in lung function. This has been the traditional matrix of uh, disease activity in COPD, and increasingly, there are relevant comorbidities of COPD, perhaps not you know, uh, interested by the, the pharma companies, but certainly for, as a clinician, we're interested in the comorbidities of COPD. And perhaps some of our biomarkers can target those. So I, I'll just comment on the latter two. And I'll provide some examples. So being in this institution, and in honor of uh, Jim, um, you know, clearly inflammation plays a significant role. Inflammation in the small airways plays a significant role in the pathogenesis of COPD. Exactly how that fits into the whole totality of COPD path pathophysiology is uncertain, but at some level, inflammation plays a role. So why not interrogate inflammatory proteins? And today I'm just going to speak on proteins because Avi will do a good job of speaking on uh, genomics. So we started off this process looking at CRP like everybody else, um, but back in the you know, early 2000s, it was novel enough. And um, Paul and I uh, thankfully collaborated with the Lung Health uh, Consortium and obtained their serum. And we measured CRP from those who were alive and those who unfortunately died uh, in, during follow-up. And sure enough, there was a signal and we rejoiced. And the signal was very big. And you can see by the small p-value how good that signal was. So we published it, and we say, hooray. And then one day, Paul said, you know, what's the spread on that thing? Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, so that's the standard deviation. <laughs> so um, yeah, so um, the mean worked out. But like FEV1, there was a lot of noise inherent in that measurement. So poor resolution. Um, and we looked through the literature, and um, it, it wasn't just us who made that determination. It was many other groups. And this is just an example. So CRP predicts respiratory mortality. Great, hooray. Predicts lung cancer mortality. Hooray. Cardiovascular disease, of course. You know, that's, now we're, you know, we're really on a roll. Breast cancer, well, important, but how does that relate to COPD? Non-malignant GI conditions. Hmm, violent suicide trauma. <laughs> and somebody yesterday, we had dinner, and they said, it probably predicts pregnancy as well. Um, so we have a bit of a problem. So, you know, uh, dis disparagingly, we, we added another uh, vowel to uh, CRP as a COPD biomarker. Um, so, and it's not surprising. If you go through, you know, CRP tissue expression, 
Where does CRP come from? You know, this big thing is the liver. There's a little bit from the lung, but mostly driven by the liver. So hepatic injury or any uh, inflammatory insult that hits the liver would produce a lot of CRP. Okay. I'll, same with IL-6, and people have looked at this. IL-6 is actually better. It's much more lung-specific than CRP, but still there's tissue expression in other organs. So it lacks specificity. It's pretty sensitive and very important biomarker in that sense, but lacks specificity. And same with fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, you know, um, there's great enthusiasm in the COPD circle as plasma fibrinogen for biomarker of COPD outcomes, but it is nonspecific. And, and, and if we understand that, then we probably could use it as some measure of biomarker. So how do we overcome the need on the stack problem? Well, why not focus on proteins that are made in the lungs or predominantly in the lungs? So we look through you know, various databases, and it you know, doesn't take very long. So Clara cell or club cell 16 is expressed mostly in the lung, a little bit in the colon and the brain and ovary, uh, but mostly in the lung. This is a log scale. So it's, it's a lung protein, lung-based protein. So that's pretty good. And I'll show you some data about CC16. Surfactants, especially surfactant protein D, is an interesting one because it's hydrophilic. You can actually measure it in plasma. It's water-soluble. And it's largely expressed in the lung. Not exclusively. There are other organs that express it, but mostly from the lung. Surfactant protein B, which is a very, very hydrophobic molecule, uh, and it's very specific to the lung. There are a little bit in other organs, but almost all from the lung. It's a log scale. The it, problem with surfactant protein B, it's, it's lipid soluble, so you can't really measure it very well in BAL fluid or uh, in the plasma. Okay, so let's, uh, let me take you through a couple of these. CC16, there are a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh, similar names for this. And, and um, I, I just want to highlight some of the people who actually did the work, which is Hei Yun and Yushen and Shina who are in the audience. They, they did the work. I get the glory, they did the work. Um, so as we talked about it this morning, uh, the, probably the most common road to COPD is something like this. Accel uh, this is normal and accelerate decline in lung function. And if we had a drug that can change um, that trajectory, that would be wonderful. And as we discussed earlier this morning, it has to start early, right? It can't be, it can't, you can't start this in stage three and four disease. But that, that looks fine, and that looks very appealing for drug companies until you actually know that patients can go multiple trajectories. They're tremendous heterogeneity. This is just mean values, and this is where the problem becomes, the noise. And if we can somehow reduce the noise, then the sample size will become more manageable. So this is where CC, we looked at CC16 as a biomarker of disease activity with respect to decline in lung function. And I'm, I'm just going to show you the, uh, the summary slide. So uh, using the Lung Health Consortium data, which comprised more than 4,800 subjects, again, on, a popular, uh, on this large cohort, one sees an inverse relationship between CC16 levels in serum and le uh, rate of decline of FEV1. So let's just focus on the only 20% that accelerate faster. It's the first quintile. We can do this, you know, do the same exercise for the la uh, latter quintile. But for the, because of time, I'll just focus on the first question. If we just picked off that 20%, that first quintile of CC16 expressors, and put them into a clinical trial, um, one would need about 3,400 subjects to get a significant p-value, assuming your clinical characteristics are exactly the same as the Lung Health Consortium. So we're probably not where we want to be in terms of sample size, but you can see how a you know, relatively crude biomarker could potentially affect how we design clinical trials. So you know, if we can reduce it down to about 2,000 or 1,000, Surely, that would make it more appealing for drug companies to invest in new drugs and put them into phase three trials using FEV1 as, a, you know, as the, um, as the uh, primary outcome. 
And the reason CC16 works like that, and I can tell you that it doesn't predict mortality. Uh, it doesn't predict comorbidities. It's really lung specific. And it, it, the reason it is, is, is because this glycoprotein is very sensitive to the effects of cigarette smoke and air pollution and you know, biomass and all these things. Uh, it's very, very sensitive. And so we think that CC16 in plasma reflects the health of the airways. <clears throat> and, and, you know, uh, this is an old um, study, but it shows you that irrespective of COPD, irrespective of disease in the lung, smokers have reduced expression of clara cells or club cells in their airways, in the bronchioles, or even in the terminal bronchioles, than non-smokers. So this protein is highly sensitive to the effects of environmental toxins. And as such, it may be a good biomarker, or a reasonable biomarker, for disease progression. Okay, surfactant protein. Let's see how th this works. And we published this uh, recently. Um, so, as I say, it's a hydrophilic. It's unlike the other uh, surfactant. It's a hydrophilic uh, molecule. So it actually gets into the plasma. The issue is, w once it gets into the plasma, what does it do? And animal studies have shown that it actually enhances atherosclerosis. It's a phospholipid. And largely through a mechanism we do not know uh, yet, it upregulates uh, lipid accumulation in plaques. Uh, our lab has shown it, and, uh, um, and other labs have shown this. So if you take mice and you, uh, you know, either inject surfactant protein D or make them deficient, you will see changes in atherosclerotic burden. And sure enough, if we take blood from, say, a cardiovascular cohort, somebody who's going in for angiography, and you do a surfactant protein D measurement, why would you do that? This is just for research setting. No you know, sane cardiologist would even think about surfactant protein D. And you follow these folks for 14 years and look at their surfactant protein D expression as a function of mortality. One measurement of surfactant protein D at time zero has this kind of discriminatory property. A full four, fourfold or almost fourfold increase in mortality if you're a high expressor. And 175 is sort of the population norm that uh, it, the Eclipse investigators have described for this particular assay. And it, it's not just the extremes. There is a dose response. So this is plotting surfactant protein D in quintiles uh, and looking at the relative risk of mortality. And as the quintiles increase, levels increase, you have a dose response. And the ROC, receiver operating characteristics of L HDL, LDL total cholesterol in this cohort was 0.55. CRP alone was 0.579. And SPD was 0.62. It beats all of the biomarkers that are well established for cardiovascular in this particular cohort. Yeah, majority of were on statins and other, you know, primary, um, preventive agents. So uh, it's probably not generalizable. And when when one looks at CVD mortality alone, you know, it's the morta total mortality is all driven by cardiovascular mortality. So it's very specific for cardiovascular disease. And it does not predict respiratory mortality or lung cancer mortality or anything like that. It's cardiovascular specific. Um, and my final, I'll wrap up this talk by, uh, you know, um, showing you some data on surfactant protein B. Now, I told you that surfactant protein B is lipid soluble. You can't really measure it reliably in plasma. But there's a proform. Thank, thank God there's a proform. Otherwise, I would be out of business, um, which is water soluble. And the reason um, is so that's how the type 2 cells secrete uh, surfactant protein B in its proform. And it's as soon as it gets out of um, the cell, it gets cleaved. The, you know, there's a carbohydrate end that gets cleaved and then becomes the small, functional, mature surfactant protein B. Now, <clears throat> again, these data have been published, and most of the work uh, has been done by Steve Lamb and Martin Tamaguji, so I, I take very little credit for this. Um, the adenocarcinoma in particular, but 
also squamous cell carcinoma and even the precursor cells secrete the proform of surfactant protein B. And this has been well demonstrated in animal models. So largely, for unknown reasons, these dysregulated cells produce bucket loads of proform of surfactant protein B. So we ask, can this blood measurement predict lung cancer? We know we probably can't predict cardiovascular disease or whatever, but can it predict a lung cancer risk? And using the pan-Canadian lung cancer screening cohort and the CARAT study in the US and two independent cohorts, we were able to validate that those with the highest expression of prosurfactant protein B in their plasma have 12-fold increase in the risk of lung cancer during a two and a half year follow-up than the low expressors. Now, the average smoker has maybe 2% risk of lung cancer, 3% risk of lung cancer at any given period of time. So CT screening is very cost inefficient in that setting. But if you know your patient has a 20% risk of lung cancer, and then that may be with the pro surfactant protein B, that may change, that should change, the cost effectiveness ratio of, so this is where we're going with this particular screening tool. So I'll end this talk by just giving you a global perspective as Mark did. Uh, we look at COPD through the COPD prism, but you know, COPD impacts on multiple systems, multiple organs, multiple parts of the world, uh, and on multiple people. Ischemic heart disease remains the leading cause, but you know, um, I can argue that lung inflammation and COPD in particular impacts on is ischemic heart disease mortality, and same with stroke. Uh, lower respiratory tract infection, clearly uh, one of the risk factors is COPD. And lung cancer, clearly, we, we know this for a fact, that COPD is an important risk factor for lung cancer. So COPD is a risk factor. It impacts on multiple uh, other uh, organ systems, and we need to be mindful of that. And we know that as clinicians. So as summary, I, you know, I, I think we would all agree that there is a pressing need for Biomark good biomarkers, not crappy ones. Throwing stuff at the wall uh, probably won't work, but maybe I'll be proven wrong. Um, and again, uh, ideal biomarker is probably not there. That relates to everything. Uh, I think the most promising ones, if we can get our heads around it and try to really refine it, are proteins that are lung-based, but that can relate to important health outcomes in COPD. Maybe not to all, but certain ones. Um, I think genomic biomarkers are, are, are very interesting. I think they may work for exacerbation. And, um, uh, you know, there was a poster presented here at this meeting, and uh, you know, our group is working with the Proof Center of Excellence to develop an Eclipse uh, a Steering Committee and so on and so on to develop genomic-based biomarkers of exacerbation. And I'll be discussing this in more detail at the uh, next ATS. And these are the people who work in the lab and generate all the data, and I get all the glory. Thank you very much. Okay, let's, there's uh, one, time for one or two quick questions of clarification. Raja? I was wondering if you could look at a marker of neutrophilic inflammation, and neutrophilic inflammation which is one of <laughs> the setup. Question. Oh, you Go planted ahead. that. No, uh, I didn't. So one of the biomarkers that we're very interested in is myeloperoxidase, which comes largely, not exclusively, but largely from activated neutrophils. And in the cardiovascular literature, it is a, the blood bio, uh, myeloperoxidase is highly predictive of a myocardial event. And in fact, you can get, if you pay 50 bucks to Life Labs, you can have your myeloperoxidase measured, uh, levels measured today. So it has that sort of thing. And what we are finding is that myeloperoxidase is probably more than just a biomarker. That it actually uh, plays an active role, uh, and this, these data will be presented at ATS uh, as well, active role in plaque rupture. So the way we think this works is you develop respiratory infection or maybe the chronic inflammation of COPD induces neutrophils to become activated. Not only do they go into the lungs, but they go to vulnerable areas such as the plaque and induces 
disruption in the cap and causes the plaque to rupture. And, and David Jaw, who worked, he was a graduate student in our lab, has developed, I think, a very elegant mouse model to, to show this. And, 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 and you inhibit the myeloperoxidase, and the plaque doesn't rupture, no matter what you do to that plaque. Any other planted questions? Turn on your mic. Why do you measure no theophilins. Why, why do you measure things in the blood when the disease is in the lung? Um, because we don't know the relationship between things in the airway and things in the heart. Repeat the question. Yeah, oh, should I repeat the question? I don't think Peter had his mic on. OK, you? so Peter's point is COPD is a lung disease. Why, why measure blood when you can measure something more direct? Uh, like Excel condensate, which don't work. <laughs> or uh, maybe induce sputum, which is kind of messy. Or maybe subject them to repeated bronchoscopies or lung biopsies. Uh, that's the problem, right? You know, I totally agree with you that you know, if we could have a non-invasive, reliable, non-invasive, simple test that we can interrogate the airways with, then that is the test we need to go after. Um, we haven't found it. Maybe other groups um, will, uh, and maybe have. Um, so in the absence of that idealized setting, we're focusing on the blood. Um, and I think the, you know, I think the paradigm that lung, uh, the COPD is exclusively a lung disease is probably outdated. Uh, I, I think there's significant evidence, both from our lab and many others, that there is a significant extra pulmonary component, and the blood is the conduit. So we're hoping that we can find the signal in the blood, but we may not get there. Okay, thanks, Don.